After three years of research, the Open African Innovation Research and Training Project, known as Open A, is making its findings public. Participants from more than 50 countries are attending a conference hosted by the University of Cape Town, where Open A's new book is being launched. Innovation happens in Africa in very complicated and complex processes that are really not ones that you can definitely recognize through these formalized metrics of measuring who is innovating and who is not innovating. The book provides results from 13 case studies that look at communal, collaborative innovation and intellectual property across nine African countries. I'm Sandy Shepard, publisher for UCT Press, and the very proud publisher of this very important book, Innovation and Intellectual Property, Collaborative Dynamics in Africa. Intellectual property in the conventional sense has always been um, captioned or conceptualized in the context of uh, a capitalist, one-person kind of breakthrough innovation that is either owned by an individual or a corporation. And little attention is paid to the knowledge production methods that are very communal and collaborative in nature. By using IP creatively, you can facilitate a kind of community. The communities operate on different levels. We need to broaden our perspectives outside of this siloed approach towards intellectual property to better create systems that are useful in practice. I think that the tendency to conceptualize these concepts is to do it on parallel tracks. So one group of people will speak innovation, another will speak IP, another will speak about collaboration. And so what I love about this book is that it brings all of those threads or those um, lines of reasoning together in one text. The book, freely available on the Open Air website and in hard copy from its publisher, covers six thematic areas. The first theme focuses on practices in Africa's informal sector. My chapter in this book is chapter three. My chapter focuses on formal and informal sector interactions with a specific focus on a new electric vehicle project at Macquarie University. What has actually happened is that they designed the car, but a lot of parts were actually fabricated by the informal artisans. It is an important innovation to be able to interpret those designs and translate them into a product. The artisans are expected not to share this information or designs with other people. So that is the extent to which uh, IP is involved. The key recommendation I make in my chapter is for government policy to not focus only on university industry relationships. They also need to look at the possibility of transferring technology to the informal artisans. The chapter that uh, Dr. Daniel and I worked on is geographical indications in relation to cocoa production and coffee in Ghana and Ethiopia respectively. A geographical indication is a type of intellectual property whereby the name of the place where product originates is used in the product's marketing and can only be used by producers meeting certain locally specific requirements. Our research can as well relate to uh, Kenyan tea or Ugandan vanilla or South African rooibos. Also, looking at the potential of place-based intellectual property is the book's Nigerian case study. We selected two clusters in Nigeria, um, one on textiles and the other on leather. Traditional textiles is an indigenous knowledge that is slowly dying. There is a high-end market for those products, but at the same time, they have to face challenges from imitation products from China and also products that are made using machine processes. The research question was how feasible it is to use communal trademarks to overcome those challenges. This is one aspect of intellectual property that is very collaborative, that is open and yet closed in the sense that people who are not producing within the cultural region or process, as in Ethiopian coffee, are excluded from this. But those who, who produce based on the traditional arable lands can really benefit from this branding method. I was trying to focus on the policy context. Is it possible to have a traditional knowledge commons in Kenya? And if it, it is, what is the policy environment that would facilitate the sustainability of this particular commons. 
If you have a TK Commons, basically it's it's a system whereby knowledge is shared among the people in a way that uh, first and foremost preserves the knowledge and at the same time it an, allows other people to use that particular knowledge beyond the, the communities for purposes of, of development. Also examining the notion of a traditional knowledge commons is the book's chapter on an existing commons established by the Kukula traditional healers in South Africa. A Kukula leader, Rodney Sibui, is in Cape Town for the book's launch. Yeah, the type of knowledge that we are having is the indigenous knowledge. It's knowledge about uh, treatment of element of diseases. And there we are using the species, the plants. Now this TK Commons is, has more the idea of sharing knowledge within all kinds of different healers. Doesn't matter which kind of healing schools they are from or where they come from, which ethnic group, to then be able to negotiate with outside interests. When we started, we were about 80 healers that come together so that if there are some potential investors or the companies that like to develop business with us, then they can come to us and then we can share the knowledge with, with them. The creators of knowledge do know what they want. They know what they need and even they, they know what their consumers want. How does our law accommodate the sharing aspect with the aspect of Propertization or commodification of what we have created. I chose uh, to work on a case study that looks at the independent musicians in Egypt to look at the priorities of the musicians themselves, but also the music uh, users or consumers, and try to better inform policymakers uh, regarding the copyright laws. What I have found is that digital music is usually v seen by both groups as something that should be there for free. Now, the, the essence in working out a business model for uh, music and creative uh, industries, as with the other knowledge goods, is trying to find a combination of versions. So in the case of music, we have the live scene, we have the CD, and we have online. We think of hybrid models, of a freemium, where there is some kind of payment that will be paid for one version, and the rest can be available for free. My chapter is entitled Reflections on Open Scholarship, Modalities and Copyright Environment in Kenya. And the focus here was the relationship between copyright on the one hand and open scholarship as well as alternative publishing in Kenya on the other hand. I found in the research that uh, the relationship between copyright and scholarship, whether traditional or open, is quite nuanced and complex. This indicates to us that uh, the work that is being done on the Creative Commons is very, very important. The chapter, co-authored by Caroline Ngobe and Lucy Abrahams, looks at how university research management in South Africa is adjusting to a new piece of intellectual property legislation. So what the Act does really is to prompt researchers and the institutions to first of all um, patent or protect by other means of intellectual property law and then to commercialize the research and the, the, the end game I suppose is to make money, commercialize, make money and then give us a return. It calls itself an IPR Act, it's not an IPR Act, let's just be absolutely clear about that. It is a patent act and the problem is that it actually misses loads of issues, it misses issues about how to disseminate knowledge in what is clearly a transition to a knowledge-intensive economy. The danger of prompting or encouraging what might become mindless patenting is that um, you will have a, a diversion of, of resources towards what is not really important. Now because there is legislation, there is a tendency to disclose any and everything. And so the tech transfer office staff now spend a lot of time trawling through reams of paper. Another chapter on publicly funded outputs is by Von Vossen Belete, who looks at the Ethiopian government's push via a 2012 policy for patenting of university research. Belete finds that the policy is misdirected. In the Ethiopian context, the major problem is the weak research capacity of the universities, not research outputs which are piling up in university laboratories because of some sort of lack of incentive to be transferred to industry.
Also, looking at publicly funded research outputs is the chapter by statistician Njoku Ola Ama, whose survey of researchers in Botswana finds low levels of IP policy awareness. The book has three chapters on patents. The chapter co-authored by Fernando Dos Santos looks at patenting of biofuel technology in Mozambique. Green technologies constitute an opportunity for, for the least developing country, and especially for Africa, which is endowed with their natural resources, and it can really create a competitive advantage for Africa. Dos Santos and his co-author from the energy company Petromoc find that all of the biofuel technology patents in Mozambique are held by foreign entities. It is important that a local technology mechanism be developed especially in relation to the small-scale industry uh, in the area of biofuels. The study by Ikechi Mbiyoji examines the lack of capacity at African national patent offices. And the final patent chapter, co-authored by Bassem Awad, looks at Egypt's attempts, largely unsuccessful to date, to encourage local development of biofuel technology. This book contains all kinds of evidence that there is abundant innovation and creativity in diverse contexts throughout the continent. So the book essentially provides now the evidence that in some cases uh, intellectual property indeed can be an incentive for innovative activity on the African continent, but in other cases can be a stumbling block. And that oftentimes it is not so much a question of either or, but it is a combination of both. A little bit of openness combined with closed systems in some respects. We believe that uh, sui generis models, models that are just made for a certain kind of innovative and creative activity, are more suitable or at least are worth uh, investigating more. When we talk about communal forms of protection, like the creative commons or the traditional knowledge commons or patent pools or communal certification schemes to brand geographic indications, these are all ways in which IP systems are leveraged to facilitate collaboration, not exclusion. The whole concept of collaboration is a dynamic that we found that is really underemphasized in intellectual property jurisprudence. And this book helps not only to tease out the essence of collaboration in production of knowledge, but also to situate it in critical context in the African societies that we were privileged to really encounter on the field.